Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's Daily Global COVID-19 Show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things COVID-19. On this daily program, we cover the health, financial, and inequality crises. We also, in the run-up to the election, cover political aspects of the crisis, as well as the elections coming up in under 30 days. Today, we have a very special episode for you, episode number 210, 210 episodes in 210 days of quarantine in New York, communicating climate and talking about climate change with Professor Scott Mandia, who is at AGW underscore prof, and there's a very interesting explanation of his Twitter handle, which you'll hear in just a few minutes. He's a professor of Earth and Space Sciences, Assistant Chair, Physical Sciences Department at Suffolk County Community College, and he's co-founder of Climate Science Rapid Response Team and Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. These episodes are part, This uh, today's episode is part of a series of episodes being produced by my students at the Stony Brook School of Journalism as part of our Digital Innovations in Journalism course. And the episode is produced by Nicholas Grasso, Sean Gribben, and Elisha Asif. You will meet Sean Gribben because he's going to be one of our co-hosts and guest hosts asking questions of Professor Mandia in just a few minutes. So you will meet the professor and meet Sean very shortly. In the meantime, please tell us where you're watching from. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Hello, everyone. I'm Sri. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for your support of this show for 210 days. We have so much to talk about today, including the passing of Eddie Van Halen. You may have seen the news, the famous guitarist. And for some of our younger friends who may not know who that is, please Google him. Please listen to his music. You have certainly heard his influence, if not heard his music yourself, uh, among many other things, apart from the songs of Van Halen. He had a massive and a fabulous guitar solo in the song Beat It by Michael Jackson. Uh, tonight, uh, we are also, uh, before, we going on, before going on the air, getting news that Stephen Miller, the, um, uh, one of the president's longest serving advisors, uh, the man whose anti-immigration stance has uh, led to him being called hate monger in this previous episode of our show. We had Janine Guerrero on the show. So she did. Uh, she wrote a book about Stephen Miller, Donald Trump, and the white nationalist agenda. And uh, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, Mr. Miller is a white supremacist who has a white supremacist agenda. But as I have said before, this coronavirus is something I would wish on no one, not even my worst enemy, and he may be among my worst enemies, because what I have seen, uh, coronavirus, uh, what I have read, uh, we had a widow's statement read on the air yesterday. She sent it to me to share with all of you. For the president to say, don't worry about COVID was such an irresponsible statement. And so I will say that with, this, with that background, that I wish him and the president and everyone a st steady, a speedy recovery. But still, we have to note that this is something that could have been avoided if the president himself and his administration, including Mr. Miller, had taken masks and the virus seriously. But tonight, our topic and our conversation is about uh, other aspects of our crises in front of us, including climate change and the crisis around it. If you have not seen the show before, we'll just tell you that this show in its first 200 episodes had more than 357 guests, 208 of them women, 1 million plus viewers and 148 million social impressions, guests from 67 cities and 19 countries, including the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. You can find all our archives at youtube.com slash 3 And we're able to do this because of our partnership with Scroll Global and Scroll.in. We're able to do this because of our sponsors, and we're grateful to all of them, and to our producers, Rose Horowitz, at Rose Horowitz 31, and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. Please follow both of them, and please 
share this right now with your friends and family as we've asked our guests to do. Tweet it right now or tag your friends on Facebook. They can always watch it later. And we are now excited to bring to you on stage here our colleague and friend who is an expert on com communicating climate and climate change, Scott Mandia at AGW Prof is here with us. And big, big thank you to Scott for joining us tonight. Hello, Professor. Well, thank you for having me tonight. Good evening. Good evening and thank you for being here. My first question always, where are you? How are you? And how is your family doing through the crisis? Uh, I'm in, I'm actually right down the road from Stony Brook. So I'm <laughs> in Long Island, New York. Um, and my family's doing well. We've uh, been socially distancing, wearing masks, washing our hands, essentially respecting the science and listening to the experts. And most people who do so are perfectly safe. And of course, now we're currently seeing that those individuals who thumb their nose at the science and didn't wear masks and didn't socially distance, they're now getting sick. And I think the unfortunate thing is, is that when a person gets sick because they're foolish, then people around them who are the innocents, so to speak, and are the ones who are being careful, are now sort of under a threat. So uh, the mask is really for everybody around you and not for yourself. I mean, so hopefully the message is out now that if the President of the United States uh, can get COVID, then anybody can. So maybe we can get a few of his supporters to maybe rethink their position on the masks. That was our hope on Friday night and on into Saturday and Sunday, Scott. But as you know, he then thumbed his nose at everything, including the mask, a chance to be empathetic, a chance to say, I understand now, I'll take it more seriously. In fact, he's now positing that he has already beaten it and he is therefore stronger and better than everybody else. I said yesterday that he will claim to be the first person to benefit from getting COVID because it makes him smarter, better, stronger, all of those things. Well, I still think most Americans are smarter than that and uh, uh, they, they're seeing what's happening. So, and you know. No, you're more, you're optimistic. So I, I like that. Uh, we're gonna have Sean Gribben, one of our students and producers of the show come in and ask you some questions. But before that, I just wanna ask you a couple of things. If you can tell us about these amazing organizations you co-founded and, and helped set up, talk, us about, talk to us about them. And then I have a question about wording and the, and, and, the, and the kind of nomenclature we use. Do you think that instead of using global warming, if 35, 40 years ago, we had started with climate change, there would have been more progress because the, by focusing on global warming, we then gave the president and everyone else who is a skeptic a chance to say, as soon as it's a little bit cooler than uh, on any cold day, look, where's global warming? Do you think that, maybe you want to answer that question first, could anything have been changed if we had chosen our words differently? I'm not saying better, and it's with hindsight, but can you tell me about that? Well, that's an interesting question because scientists have always been using the words climate change. And it was actually a Republican strategist, Fred Luntz, who uh, did a, he does polling, and he's a, he's a famous pollster, and he thought that uh, the phrase global warming was kind of scary and that climate change was softer. So it was Fred Luntz who actually started telling Republican leaders, don't use global warming, use climate change. So uh, it's often attributed to Al Gore, but this is, precedes Al Gore. Fred Luntz, by the way, is now a, a strong advocate for addressing climate change. Uh, which is, and he's still obviously a Republican. I think, and we'll talk so about- Just to clarify, it wasn't some kind of long game, smart game where he got all of us confused by doing this. So you, you believe that he honestly, uh, sincerely thought that it would be a more powerful word to use right. global warming. Okay. And, and because of that, I actually like to use the phrase global warming more than climate change because a lot of people will think, well, climate's always changed, whereas global warming, you know, it's the warming that's getting us into trouble. And, and so uh, depending on the message I'm trying to relay, I may choose to use the words global warming instead of climate change. If I'm at a conference with my peers, I'll be using climate change exclusively or climate disruption, the effects of, of climate change. I think for the general public, though, I think global warming uh, is a, a better way to actually use the phrase as long as they understand that just because outside your window it might be snowing doesn't mean the entire world is cold. So 
you have to hammer home the idea that global warming means the planet is warming in the long run and any individual day isn't necessarily going to be warmer. So I, I can see arguments for, for both, but I actually lean toward global warming when I speak to the public because that's really the concerning part. Very interesting. Thank you so much. And now you were going to tell us about your center and okay. Uh, and yeah. yeah. So um, in 2010, uh, some colleagues and I realized that scientists were not really out there speaking to the public. That they, for the most part, felt like they're publishing in their journals, uh, and it was up to sort of the media to kind of get it right. And right after the 2009 Copenhagen conference, which is kind of like the Paris climate talks. Um, a bunch of, of emails were hacked and they, the uh, climate doubters took a few sentences here and there taken out of context to, some, to make it look like somehow there was this cabal of evil climate scientists. And so at that point we got an all time low in the United States for respect for climate scientists. So my colleagues, two others decided that we were now going to form a group called the Climate Science Rapid Response Team that was going to have the world's top climate scientists essentially be on call for journalists and for politicians when they had questions about science. So we were bringing the literature to the public, to the messengers in the public, and doing so with you know plain language. And we're currently up to 162, and they're essentially the, the who's who of climate scientists around the world. Most of them are in the United States, but we have scientists in, in many countries around the world. And it's kind of like you can almost think of it as like match.com where you go in there and you're looking for some of the meat. Well, here, the journalists and the politicians can say, look, I have these climate questions. I'm not sure who the experts are. Can you point me the way? We make the handshake and then they, they start having a discussion. Uh, so we've actually provided scientists uh, for the White House when in 2013 when there was a tornado outbreak all the way down to a high school newspaper journalist. So pretty much both, both sides of Congress the White House, and pretty much every news organization that's out there. The, so that was one of my initiatives. The other one is uh, we started, a colleague of mine started in 2012, Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. And we have a Twitter handle, at ClimeSciDef, which you can see, or you can just search for Climate Science Defense Fund. And we saw uh, scientists being attacked by people who found their science to be inconvenient to the bottom line. And they were essentially trying to force email dumps and they were taking them to court, anything to get them to avoid doing their research. So we started this organization and we now have lawyers who run the organization. And we have several lawyers on the board who have argued over 80 cases at the United States Supreme Court level. And this is all free of charge for scientists. So not only are we giving them helpful advice to have them avoid falling into these sort of landmines, if they do end up stepping on a a, a legal landmine, we have representation for them. It's a shame we need the service, but the service is needed and it's there. Thank you. Uh, before we bring in our student uh, host, I want to ask you about your Twitter handle, AGW underscore prof. Yes. Yeah, so, what is the origin of that and what does that mean? Yeah. So, I wanted a short handle, right? So, you wouldn't have to be typing a lot. AGW stands for Anthropogenic Global Warming. Anthropogenic is a very sciencey term for human cost. So AGW is known as the human cause of climate change, not anything natural. And so because I teach courses in climate change and all of the climate change experienced since 1960 is due to humans, we are now entering what some would call the Anthropocene where humans are now dominating uh, the climate and geology of, of the earth. So uh, that's what I ended up coming up with, it stuck so I keep using that. Uh, ex excellent. Let's see who else is watching. Jonathan's watching from the East Village. Have you been in the village since the crisis started? No, um, we've been extremely locked down here. Um, we have eaten outside twice in a place that's very socially distant. There are only a handful of people who we actually even hang out with because we know they're also being safe. But we actually had to tell some friends of ours that, no, I'm sorry, our kids can't play together. We can't go over there because they were engaging what we thought was fairly risky behavior. Um, so I just look at this whole thing as it's a matter of time. And at some point, we're going to get beyond this. Uh, so I'm willing to err on the side of caution. And I've got two kids. And I think every parent wants a child to be safe. In fact, that's why I got involved with climate change. I want my kids to be safe as they go into the future. 
so we're not taking any chances. Even though everybody's got COVID fatigue and they want to get back to the normal life, I think it's take your time now, be safe, and then at some point we're going to look back on this. I really do believe that. Oh, oh, wonderful to hear that. Jake uh, Basile says, hey, from SBU, good luck to my dude, Sean, Nick, and Elijah, who produced this show. Pradnia is watching from Silver Spring, Maryland, and Tim Sohn is tuning in from the land of bears, the bears and the turkeys. Now, I know where that is. I don't know if you want to guess where he's from. Is that enough of a clue? Well, if it's turkeys, I would think Washington, D.C. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, the Bears, I, I'm going to be thinking football and think Chicago. but Yeah, so he's in Northeast Pennsylvania. And oh, he's, okay. just been, right. he's just been voted in as class parent of the PTO, his fourth grader's class. He's excited. I guess it's all on. You don't have to make cupcakes because it must be all online, right? Unless, of course, he's in person and then there's a lot of work involved. The next two viewers are from Kerala, India. Have you been? No. To India at all? No, no we've, got, to India. we've got to get you there. Uh, a, a country that... Obviously, they care a lot about climate change, but their production and work is also cause of, along with China, of a lot of the, along with the United States, of, of climate change. Right. My mom's watching from Kerala, India, so I have to uh, say hello to her. Hi, Amma, love you. Hi, I'm Mom. sorry I'm not with you. It was her birthday last week. And, oh. uh, yeah. uh, and Tim is tagging some of his friends, and Charles and Mary are watching from Chicago, where they're visiting their daughter. Your favorite Chicago memory? My favorite Chicago. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't. I have not been to Chicago other than O'Hare Airport, and that's not really me. okay. So we. So what happens on my show is that people get like a travel list of ideas of places to go. So we've got India on your list, and I think Chicago might be easier uh, to get yeah. you get you there first. So we got to work on that. Yeah, and I could take a train there. I don't like to fly because of the carbon emissions. So going to India would definitely be emitting some carbon. So you'd have to really. You'd have to promise me a heck of a lot of curry to get me to go over there. That's for sure. Well, they've got lots of curry, but just just to understand, just so you you don't fly because of the climb of the uh, carbon footprint the, and the carbon emission. You don't believe in like personal um, offsets and things like that. You think those are not yeah. enough? I've purchased carbon offsets. I belong to TerraPass, and whenever I do, on the rare occasion, fly to a conference. If I have to fly, like at San Francisco, AGUs at San Francisco, you just can't take a train. It takes too long. Um, I will offset my carbon, but it's still better to not emit the carbon than it is to offset it. And I also think it's we have to model good behavior. And so I've become a plant-based diet person as much as possible. Um, and I try to fly as little as possible. And I think that puts, and you see the AGU obviously with COVID too, is putting out a virtual conference. I think the more scientists that say they decline to fly, the more pressure on these conferences to go virtual uh, because obviously they have to pay for their conference. And if scientists aren't attending, then they're not paying, so. Wow, this is, I mean, that's fascinating just in that you're, you're you're really following through on your beliefs about this. And so I salute you for that. And with that, let's bring on our, and I'd love to hear uh, opinions and comments from people in the in the comment section. We'll bring those on later, but let's bring on now uh, uh, Sean Gribben, who is a student at Stony Brook and one of my students. Uh, and he is, unlike you and me, we're dressed in t-shirts. He's dressed up because he knows this is, uh, this is, uh, a, a chance for him to uh, ask serious questions of a serious scientist. So please welcome Sean Gribben. Hi, Sean. Hi. I guess this is, there's no going back now, is there? No, you're, you're, <laughs> on, you're on the air. So I'm going to step away and you will uh, tell, you know, you'll, you'll do some questioning. And I know uh, the professor has some slides to share. So I will share them as, the, as, as you call for them. Scott, I will. Or Scott and Sean, I'll I'll bring them up. Just let me know when you're ready to do that. But meanwhile, I know you have some questions. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. I guess I have. Oh, oh. okay. I'm here, right? You are there. Cool. Awesome. I guess we're doing this. You know, it was funny while you and Sri were talking. Uh, my Amazon Alexa started chiming in, and I had to unplug it before I got on here because it wanted to be a part of this interview. Yes, Amazon is always listening. Yes, yes, they are. So I think we're going to start out with a bit of a hopeful note. 
So before this interview, you had mentioned to my friend Nick that you are actually feeling more hopeful about the current course that the world is on than you used to be. What made you change your stance to this more optimistic tone? Well, I've said for a long time that uh, there's actually money to be made in shifting away from fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, and to renewable energies such as wind, solar, geothermal, hydropower, dams, that kind of thing. And that once people, once businesses figure out, and energy efficiency, you know, we all have the LED light bulbs now. So once people figured out that this was a economic benefit, uh, then they were going to make the switch. And five years ago, uh, we were globally emitting carbon on what's called the worst case emission trajectory. And that was committing us to potentially warming the planet to over 11 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Now that's significant because a few degrees of temperature change have called, caused major glaciers to advance, ice sheets, or to retreat, and sea levels to change by over 100 feet, 200 feet. Uh, we are now not on the worst case path. The last year and a half or two, we are on the second worst case path, <laughs> but it's not the worst. And you're starting to see a lot more uh, people doing energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, people are seeing the business value. We are having more and more governments build in plans to give incentives to companies. So although we're not moving quickly enough, we are moving forward. And I was probably one of the only people in 2016 when the Trump administration came in that, you know, wasn't doom and gloom. Everyone said, how come you're, I said, because whether you're a Republican or Democrat, if there's a dollar to be made, you're going to do it. And so I, I said, you know, the Trump administration is probably going to set us back, but it's not going to stop us from what I know is going to happen down the road. It's just unfortunately going to be slowing us down. Okay. So talking on the economy then, so how would you feel that combating climate change is more of an investment than a cost? Yeah, so I think one of the, the big problems is that when you look at the social science research, the folks who are resisting the science, they're subconsciously resisting the solutions they see coming. And, and, uh, and in this country, that's typically in the Republican Party. All right. Although there are some very in, uh, sort of eco-friendly Republicans in general, that party and its leaders are resistant to, to the science because somehow in their subconscious, they believe it means more taxes, bigger government, companies are going to be punished for polluting, uh, when in fact, uh, it's an economic opportunity. Because, for example, I'm sure just about everybody who's listening right now probably has some LED light bulbs in the house. And we all know LED light bulbs cost more than the old fashioned incandescent ones. But we all felt smart about buying it. We didn't say, oh my gosh, look at the cost of this. We said, wow, look how much money I'm gonna save by paying for this bulb. Or people who buy stocks, right? If I put $1,000 down and buy some stock in a company, I don't have that $1,000 anymore. But I feel smart because I feel like this company is gonna do well and that stock is, be, is going to be worth more than $1,000 at some future point. So all of these things we're calling investments. Climate change, the solutions to climate change are investments. When you build the solar farms, when you build the wind farms, when you build the dams, when you build the geothermal plants, yes, you have to spend money to build them, just like we spent money to build coal plants. We, every time you drive around the street, you see all the power lines everywhere. They didn't just magically appear. We spent money because we knew that in the long run, hey, we're gonna get energy now, we're gonna be more efficient. So all of these things are investments that down the road are going to save us money. And I think more and more businesses realize that. And as long as we act now, then businesses can decide how do they best want to reduce their emissions. If we keep sticking our head in the sand and denying the science and saying we're not gonna do anything, then the problem becomes so big that then government will tell us what we have to do. So we start to lose our are essentially our choice and the government it will become the big brother who forces it down our throat. So I, I see, I have solar on my house. It's a lease. It costs me nothing and it saves me 25%. My electric bill is on Long Island here, which is expensive. It's under $90 a month. So going off of the economy, then influencing people to change their ways and, you know, work to be better towards it. I have to ask you a question because you had mentioned this prior, but as you can see all my photos here to set up my background to get the whole fire and ice, doom and gloom 
of climate change. You mentioned that uh, pictures of cute animals aren't really going to do the job, but pictures of these industrial fires and catastrophes will. Why do you feel that is the case? Okay, well, I, it's not a feeling. It's, it's supported by research. So when you actually um, look at the psychologists and sociologists who study these issues, um, messaging is crucial and imagery is crucial. Uh, for example, I remember I was at a, a science conference uh, in Washington, D.C. in 2012, and there was a picture of a dried out lake and a pier. And I thought, oh, well, you know, that's a shame, it dried out, whatever. And then they said, don't show a dried out lake, show this instead. And then on the pier, they had a little boy with a fishing rod with his back. And I was like, oh, my God, that is so awful. That's so sad. I have kids. And it personalized that image. And it meant that drought wasn't just drought. It was this poor kid now isn't going to be able to fish, which is an American pastime. Um, and so the idea is that the people who need to get on board climate change, they generally aren't considered environmentalists. They're not donating tons of money to the Audubon Society, and they're not out there to save the polar bears. So I think the polar bears actually backfire, and they say, oh, not another polar bear. So the better thing to do is show a an American farmer, particularly an older white American farmer, because the demographic that resists climate tends to be old white males in this country. So show a farmer who basically, whose drought has just devastated his crop, and that's gonna cause him financial hardship and raise food prices for all of us, or more taxes if the government has to bail them out. Uh, those are gonna be far better to show somebody, or the multi-billion dollar weather extremes we've been having over the last 15, 20 years, that's all tax dollars. Uh, the sea level rise, these big storms, we now have a Category 4 hurricane in the Gulf. It looks like it's going to, in the next few days, impact New Orleans yet again. They're going to actually have seven named storms hitting the Gulf Coast, which is unprecedented. We all pay for that, and there, there are lives there, and the Gulf Coast is a big oil and gas producing area. So um, these are the types of messages that reach people who need to. We have to make it personal. Generally, if you can, make it local, too. So when I'm talking to people... In New York, I'm going to use local examples in New York, for example, right? But uh, yeah, so fire, fire is a good imagery because everybody knows that uh, that's going to uh, cause a lot of financial hardship. Uh, people are going to die. And I think the better imagery is um, something along the lines of here's how climate change affects you, particularly how it affects your pocket, because that's where the, those that resist climate really care, financial burdens. All right. So going off of that, then, um, essentially, then journalists and the media should stop showing pictures like, you know, the ice caps melting and polar bears and definitely focus more on these photos. So what I want to go off of then is what is the media missing when it comes to covering climate change? Well, I one of the problems with media is it's because it is a business and in a sense it's entertainment. Uh, I think too many people are tuning into channels that are clearly left or right of center and have too many talking heads opinion. Uh, so me personally, uh, my homepage is Reuters and Reuters is a newswire. They don't, they don't flavor the news at all. They say, here's what happened. Here's what this person said. And they sell that news to, maybe a Fox News or an MSNBC or something, they repack it for the audience. I think we've gotten to the point now where too many people are tuning in to hear what they want to hear instead of what's actually going on. Um, and in science, the, as you know, being at Stony Brook, that um, good, strong science journalists aren't, aren't uh, out there as much because sort of the newspaper is deciding that's not where the the money is. And I think it's a mistake, but there are often journalists who, when they came to the rapid response team, they were a sports journalist or an economics journalist, something like financial, and they're now on the desk for climate. Um, it's unfortunate that climate change is, I say COVID is the greatest short-term threat to our health right now, and climate change is the greatest long-term long -term threat to our health. Can you imagine if we had the coverage about climate change that we now have about COVID? That we would be living in a different world. Unfortunately, humans are wired to see what's happening today only. So that's why only when you really get an extreme do people start talking about climate change. And you don't wish for extremes because people get hurt or cost money, and they don't happen all the time. That's why it's called an extreme. 
Um, so I think journalists cover what's going on currently, and they also may tailor it to their audience. And so climate change doesn't get the coverage that it should. So essentially what you just said then is that it is extremely difficult to do science journalism and convey it in a way because of people's confirmation bias. Yes. So could you talk a bit more about confirmation bias, what it is, and what is the best way we can combat it? Yeah, that's a good one. That's tough. So confirmation bias is people are going to look for what they think is true. When they see it, the brain is going to say, oh, I knew it. So one of the analogies I use is suppose someone's afraid to fly. Now, we know that the data shows that flying is one of the safest ways to travel. But when a plane goes down with 200 people on it, it's obviously a stark reminder that it's not perfect. And so people who are afraid to fly expect something bad's going to happen when they get on a plane. So let's say they get on a plane 10 times. Every single time they stepped on a plane, they thought something bad's going to happen. And you know what? The first nine times, nothing went wrong. The 10th time, there's an issue. They're going to go, I knew it. I knew it. I knew there was going to be a problem. And they don't realize that you thought there was going to be a problem. And your brain only made a connection when it actually happened. So if you think that uh, polar bears are actually growing in population, and you see somewhere that, oh, my gosh, this group of polar bears has increased in the last 10 years. See, there's no climate change. And you don't read further. Yeah, because you used to be able to hunt them. Now you're not allowed to hunt them. Right. Mm -hmm. So things like that. Or if you think uh, it's not getting warmer. And like, for example, 2009, 2020 is probably going to be the second hottest year on record. Somebody's going to actually say, see, global warming's over. This is only the second hottest year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. That's confirmation bias. And then there's also something similar called motivated reasoning, which means you do and say things um, to achieve some goal and some value that you have. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of that. And that's just human nature. We all do it. So uh, there's a reason scientists, for example, are going to use something known as a double blind study where let's just say it's medicine, right? A COVID vaccine or something. They're going to give one group of vaccine and one group of placebo they're not the people taking it don't know if they're getting the real one or the fake one the doctors who are prescribing it also don't know if they're giving the real one or the fake one because if a doctor knows they're giving a fake one to somebody maybe they give some physical facial clues that well this is just sugar water you know so the only way you can really solve that is to control for every possible variable and you just can't do that in, in sociology psychology you have to try um, but people have their biases when they come to the table and you, you just got to hope that uh, the science wins out. But the way to do that is show them the science that matters to them. Yeah. And so I see you have a, a picture loading up there. Yeah. So this is from your own personal slideshow. Yes. So if, would you like to go into a little bit about what this graph is? Okay. So we got to go forward a little bit. All right. So you can stop right there for a moment. So. There's a group out of Yale and George Mason that um, polls the country, typical Americans, uh, all the de different demographics, and they ask them questions about climate change, what causes it, you know, how important it is it, and they end up coming up every year with what's called the Six Americas Report. And what you can see on this particular graphic is that uh, the alarmed group, which I clearly am in, and pretty much every climate scientist, 29%, concerned 30%. So right off the bat, a majority of Americans are either concerned or really alarmed about climate change. So it's a majority. Remember, this is Republicans and Democrats. It's a huge mix. 17% are cautious. So we have almost three-fourths of the country of Americans saying that this is at least concerning and maybe even quite alarming. And then you go to the other end, you have doubtful 9%. Those are people who perhaps could change their mind, but it takes a real seasoned veteran to get them to switch. And then dismissive is basically deniers, uh, you know, flat earth, moon is made of cheese kind of thing. That's only 9%. So really, it's a very small fraction of people who are not on board with the science. And then up top, you see 100 climate scientists, and it's 97 to 98% will say that humans are causing global warming. And what's interesting about that stat, I don't even like that stat, because when you look at the publications, and I've actually written on this, when you look at the publications of the 3% who don't think it's humans, their papers are fraught with mistakes and errors. So if you actually look at papers that have really, really solid science, 
all the papers that have a position on global warming say it's humans. So if you go to the next slide, I'll tell you another reason why I'm hopeful. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, the next slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. So when you look at this slide, what you'll see is, look at the top, dismissive and doubtful. Mm -hmm. the last five years, those percentages have decreased. And the percentage of alarmed and concerned has increased, which means Americans are finally starting to get it. And I do think part of that is because the news is starting to report climate change as, yes, it's humans, and we're not going to debate that. We're going to move on to what do we do about it policy, which is where we should be. And I think they're just opening their eyes. They're just seeing everything that's going on. So uh, you you actually have your grandparents saying, this is just, we've never seen this before. And I've been around a long time. This is just not normal. So uh, I, I think also younger folks like yourself uh, are getting much more involved because you know that we're leaving you a mess to clean up mm -hmm. because you now have power with social media. You can organize and your voices are now getting louder and louder. You didn't have that 20 years ago. I never could organize as quickly as you folks can. Um, so I think all of that is pushing us in a good direction. There's reasons why I'm positive. All right. So going on that then, even though we have people waking up and seeing that climate change is an issue, there still seems to be misinformation. So what allows for this misinformation to spread? Well, there's a few things. Uh, I think the first thing is that people are tuning in to fake news, basically. Um, there are too many news stations out there and on social media where people are putting things up that are just garbage. And because it aligns with their views, they think it's true. And you'll see this, you'll see people tweet and Facebook and, and Instagram. Well, I feel as though, or I believe, and that's not how the world works. You can just, everybody can have an opinion, but an opinion doesn't mean it's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, facts are facts and evidence is evidence. So scientists are trained to essentially let the data, the evidence drive our conclusions. We start with a hypothesis, an educated guess, and then we do the testing and we determine was the hypothesis correct or not. So we end up with the conclusion. Too many people now because of social media start with a conclusion, then they look for data to support it. And they're going backwards basically. And then because you have these news stations and these talking heads, putting the doubt in people's minds. Um, and, and the social scientists would say that, for example, people who tend to lean more toward Republican conservative values, loyalty is a much more important trait to have than for liberals. And so the idea is if they feel as though one of their own is being attacked, they're going to circle the wagons and protect that person, even if that person's being attacked for being wrong about something. And so that doesn't help. So what I would like to see is people who are saying things that are incorrect about climate science, they should be corrected by their own group. Because if not, then they're going to keep being allowed to say it. Uh, but now you're getting into the way our brains are wired. And unfortunately, um, politically, most of us are going to be a Republican or Democrat based on how our brain is wired more than almost anything else. Mm. All right. So going off of that, then, what do you feel is the biggest op obstacle for reporters when writing or broadcasting about climate change? <laughs> the editor. <laughs> the editor? Why would you yeah. say that? Uh, because uh, I've seen this happen many, many times. The editor often picks the headline. Mm. And if you look at the social science research, there's something called the familiarity effect. And that means the brain tends to remember the first thing it sees, the bolded thing, the bigger font, basically the headline. And so there'll be a story about how burning coal, oil, and gas causes global warming at CO2. The journalists will write this great story on it, and the editor will say, we need a hook. We need the headline because people won't read past the headline. So the headline will be, is it really CO2? Or oh maybe God. it's the sun, you know? And so mm -hmm. people just right off the bat. And I remember we had someone who wrote for a paper in Reno, Nevada, use our service. And he said, take a look at this. And we said, oh, the, the title is terrible. You start talking about, is snowpack increasing in a warmer world? And this whole article is about snowpack decreasing. And mm -hmm. we said, they're not going to read past the headline. He said, no, I've got educated readers. They're going to. And the first Facebook comment on the story was, you global warming denier, I can't believe. And it obviously they never read anything but the headline. So um, I think 
it's like anything. If you're writing a good story, there's got to be a hook. You've got to, it's got to be controversy, right? It's got to be drama. And it's kind of hard to do that with climate change unless there's extreme weather. You know, it's really funny you say that because when we were trying to come up with the title for this show, I wanted it to be something corny, like a hot topic, climate change or something like that. But we ended up going with communicating climate. So it's kind of interesting that you would say that the editor has that power because, so, yeah. yeah. So when I've done this talk before, you know what I put as the title? What? So this climate denier walks into a bar, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> That's my title because it's a hook. Mm. People are, you know, what's this going to be about? Yeah. I want to hear the punchline. Exactly. Mm. All right. So then going off of that, then I feel like I've been saying that a lot. Um, Ooh, we have books here. Yes. Merchants so, of Doubt. Oh, is, these books. Yeah. So of those three, Merchants of Doubt, I would re I would recommend uh, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway. Uh, Naomi Oreskes is actually on the board of the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. Um, she was a professor of history, science history in San Diego. Now she's at Harvard, but she was at San Diego and she said, you know, I'm curious what is the consensus on scientists who think humans are causing global warming? And so she randomly selected 1,000 journal article abstracts. Now, for people who aren't sure what that is, it's a little summary of the entire paper. So it's kind of like if you bought a book, there would be a one-page summary of everything you're going to read in that book without all the details. So the abstract always appears at the top of the paper, so you get a rough idea of what you're gonna read and the conclusions even right there. So often you can read an abstract and pretty much know what's in the paper without getting into all the gory details. So she randomly selected a thousand using a journal database search and she searched for the phrases global warming, climate change. And of the 1000 abstracts, not a single one said climate change was caused by anything other than humans. And so she published that and boy, they came after her. So she, has documented that the playbook that the climate deniers use are, is the same playbook that the tobacco industry used to try to convince people that secondhand smoke wasn't harmful. It's really? the same playbook, it's exactly the same playbook and the same people who said there was no ozone hole. It's mm -hmm. the same playbook and the same people who said humans aren't causing acid rain. So it's the same thing. There's a handful of scientists who believe that See, I first thought this was about scientists just making money to be controversial because mm -hmm. they were making money. They were getting paid by Exxon Mobil and tobacco and whatnot to, to go against the science. But it turns out it's a lot deeper than that. They honestly believe in their heart of hearts that they're patriots and that environmentalism is essentially a watermelon, green on the outside, red on the inside, that this is communism cloaked in this pleasant sounding environmentalism. So they really thought they were battling socialism and communism. And as I often say to my students, when you feel passionate about something, you probably work much harder at it than even the job you're paid to do. It's like your hobby, mm -hmm. you work harder. So these people, yeah, they were paid to basically lie, but they really felt like they were saving the country. Uh, and it's really hard to fight that. So Merchants of Doubt, if you read that book, you are gonna get hot in the face and the ears. I remember when I was reading and I thought I knew and, and they, they actually attacked scientists and ruined their lives. There's a famous scientist, Ben Santer, who was the first, he works at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, he was the first scientist to basically say in a global report, humans can now see an, uh, the fingerprint of human activity in global warming. It's the first time that statement was made and they went after him, the Wall Street Journal on TV and he's now divorced, he's, he's had to fight for custody of his children, they ruined that guy, but he's stayed strong and now he's actually a very strong advocate for climate scientists. Uh, but if you can't go after the science, undermine the scientists. And, and so another reason why we have the Legal Defense Fund to protect people like this. That wasn't around back then. Yeah, I mean that. So essentially, scientists are even at risk of cancel culture, not oh, just big politicians and celebrities. Oh, you, you just can't believe some of the hate mail and hate Twitter. Have you gotten hate mail? Yes. I actually really? had two that I had to refer to my college's legal counsel and one to security because the, the guy mm -hmm. was local and I, you know, but I'm not a big player like some of these folks who 
uh, like Michael Mann, you know, dead rat on the doorstep, a white powder in the mailbox that they have to now inspect and everything. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's wild. I would never expect hate mail for something like that. But then again, I haven't received hate mail yet. So, you know, no, after this episode either. <laughs> I hope I don't receive hate mail for this. I episode. hope you don't either because that's a reflection on me too. <laughs> yeah, I that that wouldn't be good. I I got my nice jacket on. I don't need anything saying that I look like a Jersey boy. I I just, you know. Anyway, moving on. So, next question. Um Part of your research and expertise revolves around the Northeastern hurricane of 1938. Yeah. And so I was wondering if we could talk about future implications of climate change What w uh, while looking to the past. What was so devastating about that hurricane? And was Superstorm Sandy the next 100-year hurricane? Or are we expecting another one in the coming years? Yeah, so several questions there. First of all, you have to remember in 1938, we didn't have satellite and radar technology. So they just didn't really see it coming. There were some ship reports that they knew there was a hurricane off the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, the official um, so weather, it was called the Weather Bureau, not the National Weather Service. The Weather Bureau said it's going to go out to sea because they just thought the westerly winds that carry storms west to east would take it out to sea. And the other factor was because it was caught in this jet stream that was running directly south to north, the storm was moving anywhere from 50 to 70 miles per hour. So uh, that actually adds to the forward wind. So I guess the metaphor that I would use is you imagine a pitcher on the mound, right? And the pitcher throws a 130 mile per hour fastball. Don't worry, 130 mile per hour fastball because that was the winds around the storm. Well, if the pitcher is driving at you in a car at 50 miles per hour and throws the ball at 130, that ball comes at you at 180 now. If, on the other hand, you're, the car is moving backwards, if you're on the back side of the storm like New York City, you subtract that 50 to 70 miles per hour. So New York City only had tropical storm force winds. They just thought it was like a gale. And the east end of Long Island was being wiped clean. Um, now we have satellite and radar, so we can see uh hurricane delta right now in the caribbean we can see what it's doing and where you know generally where it's going with fancy models so that was bad because we really couldn't watch it and it was moving so quickly that once it was upon people they there really was nothing they could do um, as far as climate change the one thing i always tell everybody is whenever there's a hurricane and people start arguing about climate change first of all climate change influences every hurricane you can't say climate change causes hurricanes because climate change is not the spark, right? So if you imagine uh, a hurricane is a fire in a fireplace, right? You've got these logs. Well, the logs don't just spontaneously combust. You need a spark. So climate change is never going to be that spark. What climate change is, it's the extra logs now in that fire. So if you get the spark, you get the conditions for a hurricane, climate change is going to make it more intense. And we're already seeing that with more in the Atlantic, more major hurricanes more category three, four, and five hurricanes. But even if that weren't the case, there's a lot with climate change. And that is, we know the sea levels are rising due to climate, right? Mm -hmm. So we have two factors that increase sea level. Most people will talk about ice melting, Greenland and Antarctic ice. So ice on land, when it melts, the water flows into the oceans. That's absolutely adding water to sea level, right? Then if you heat up a balloon, right, it expands. Well, if you heat up water, it takes up more space. So mm -hmm. the water is doing something called thermal expansion. So the fact that we're warming the oceans and we're melting ice is causing the ocean basically to do this. And so the, the metaphor is, let's imagine we have basketball players. I'll shift to basketball because, you know, the playoffs are on for both MLB and NBA. <laughs> so we'll go to basketball and the, the rim is 10 feet. Mm -hmm. right? So there's certain players maybe who can't dunk. But if you raise the floor a foot, which is about how much higher the water is, around New York. If you raise the, the court a foot, now the rim is only nine feet up. So now more basketball players can dunk. So if you imagine that's the seawall, mm -hmm. storms that maybe a hundred years ago wouldn't go over the seawall, now there's those storms will because everything's a foot higher. So you got to remember, you got to remember that all that matters is that last little inch there, right? So if we imagine, let me get my hand here, if we imagine that 
top of my glasses is the seawall. My hand's the water. It's going up. It's going up. Going up. So nobody's getting flooded. Like nobody's getting flooded. Nobody's getting flooded. Nobody's getting flooded. Boom! That last inch <laughs> rushes over the seawall. New Orleans is flooded. Right, so we saw in Hurricane Irene, New York City missed getting the subways flooded by two inches. If that storm had been two inch more storm surge, it would have flooded. And Sandy, of course, just flooded everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so a foot of sea level rise is huge because every storm that comes in now is a foot closer to the top of that seawall. And we're expecting by the end of the century, probably four, five, or six feet of sea level rise in these parts. So Places that are along the coastline now are going to have to elevate or retreat or fortify, put barriers up. Mm -hmm. So now tying it into our current crisis, um, has COVID-19 had any impact on the path that we are on? Well, it's interesting because with the global economy slowing down, there was some thought that um, carbon emissions might decrease and maybe offset some of the warming. Um, but most of our carbon that we emit into the atmosphere is to provide electricity mm -hmm. and still providing electricity for most of the world. So yes, there might've been a little less CO2 emitted to the atmosphere, but it was basically, it's going to be inconsequential. As I said, 2019 is probably going to end up being the second hottest year on record. Mm -hmm. However, what I do think COVID demonstrates is that when experts warn you for decades that this bad thing is coming, and you don't do anything about it. We were not prepared. We should have been prepared because, uh, for example, New Orleans. I, I have it on my website. I actually wrote a book, and two, it came out two weeks before Sandy hit about mm -hmm. sea level rise. And we even said in the book, I mean, so the experts have been telling us we're going to have a devastating flood in New Orleans. New York's going to get hammered, whatever. We know there's going to be a pandemic. And they don't listen. They don't listen. And then when it comes, you're not ready for it. And worse... In the middle of this disaster, we have people denying the science. Mm. So we're in the middle of a climate change disaster, or almost a disaster, and people are denying the science. Well, you see what's happening with COVID? Same thing's going to happen with climate change. If we don't listen to the experts, we're just going to make things worse down the road. And none of this is going to be good for the economy. None of it. So then what lessons can we learn from the COVID crisis to apply to the climate change crisis? <laughs> The most important thing, I, my students always ask me, what's the one thing I can do to make a difference in climate change? I say vote, register to vote, vote, and vote for politicians who know how serious climate change is. And uh, my students who are, I'm, I'm not a fool, I know that in my class I have both re Republican and Democrats, and I say to my students, if you're a registered Republican, I'm going to ask you to leave your party. I want you to stay in your party and change your party's opinion on this issue. Because it turns out in this country, it's the Republican Party that's pretty much holding everything up. So they actually have the power. So if they get on board with climate change, then we can really make some rapid changes. And I think eventually they will, because a majority of people in the country, including Republicans, are now putting climate change as a more important issue. But even with Republican ranks, when a survey was surveys have been put out, they say, what's the one issue where you think your leaders are are not really listening to you. And climate change was one, the number one issue. But those same people said climate change was their 15th most important issue. Well, that's not going to cut it. This is why you're not seeing these types of questions in the debates like they should be. Mm. Although there was a climate question in the last debate. Hello, Professor. How do you do? Hello. This is a great conversation. One of the critiques that my students made about my episodes before they were producing them is that they're too long. And so we promise that we will uh, <laughs> try to keep them a little tighter. But uh, Professor Mandia, that was fantastic. I learned so much. I know that Sean did as well. There are some questions that have come in. I just want to make sure we cover that and we'll let you get back to your evening on a Tuesday night here in, uh, in New York. Uh, Rick Botello asks, uh, is uninhabitable Earth a useful frame to debate the fate of human and planetary health? Will we make the changes quick enough? Uh, well, I, I think the most important messages are choice, hope, and economics. So I think when you lead with the doom and gloom and the worst case scenario, you're going to lose some people right off the bat. Uh, so I think the, and you probably saw the way I spoke tonight, that um, message of hope 
And I think people want to feel like they have control of their destiny. And, and the, the sooner we act, the more that's going to be true. Uh, but I think despair is probably never a, a good thing. So, although it's easy to get despair with this one. Mark says, will we continue? He's watching from Durham, North Carolina. Will we continue to see increases in hurricanes? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So intensity of hurricanes, absolutely. The, the, number, of intense, the number of intense hurricanes, absolutely. The total number of hurricanes, now this year is an exception because it's probably going to break the record that we had in 2005. Uh, there may actually be fewer total number of hurricanes, and that has to do with this feature of El Nino and La Nina, how it influences Atlantic hurricanes. However, I always tell my students, one category three will do more damage than five category ones. Mm. So you just don't want the intense ones, and we're certain to get more intense ones because it's just physically more energy in the atmosphere and the ocean. It's just basic thermodynamics. That is, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. And uh, one of the questions is, uh, where can we get a hold of Professor Mandia's work? Uh, it just Google my name. I'll come right up. Uh, what is the best? Is there a, one website? Is that presentation that you made? Where can people find it? Some of those slides were fascinating. I thought, by the way, that there were far more skeptics among uh, the American yeah. public than what you were showing. So I'm pleased to hear that. Yeah. The squeaky wheel, right? Makes you know, uh, they they they're amplified. They have a megaphone because the fossil fuel lobby basically gives them a big megaphone. Um, yeah, so I have a faculty homepage. I have off of that I have a huge global warming site, and I also have a Hurricane of Thirty Eight website there. Um, you can follow me on on Twitter. I will warn you that I do get political. I'm one of the few climate scientists that will get out there and get political. I also am a craft beer and whiskey fan, so I'll talk about that too. Um, scientists are not just do, looking at data all the time, right? Um, but yeah, I would say if you just if you Google my name, I think the first thing that comes up is my faculty website, and you can pretty much get to everywhere from that. Thank you, and and Mandia, the name. Where is that? What's your family uh, background? So my my, I was born in this country. My parents are born in this country. My father's family was from Italy, so that's Italian. My mother's side is German, so I'm, I guess I'm heritage-wise half Italian, half German. Uh, but I like to say um, I'm just I'm American. <laughs> Fabulous. One of the things that uh, uh, I saw a nice comment here, Mark says, Sean, as a veteran journalist like Sri, must say you're doing a great job. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> part of it is listening to the guest and then following their what they're saying rather than our preset set of questions. So we normally do a debrief off camera, but I'm going to ask Professor uh, Scott to uh, to give us feedback on his on on Sean's performance, Scott, right now on yeah. camera. God. <laughs> well, first of all, there's no question he was the best dressed of us on this screen. Right? And he had some nice graphics behind him. Uh, I have, it looks well, like. I, I have to attribute that to my team. Yeah. My team, Elijah, Nick, they, they did a great job here. Yeah. Now, I thought you were very good. You were very patient. I can get very excited. And sometimes I interrupt. You were very good about letting me do my thing. You had some very good questions. Uh, you never hesitated to to ask me the next thing that like you just seemed to dovetail. It was almost like you knew what I was about to say, which was <laughs> kind of weird. <laughs> no, you did a great job. Right. You really did. You definitely are, are act more experienced beyond your years, which is great. We need more young uh, people out there spreading the message. So good. It's hope. Yeah. And Professor, what, what are you going to be looking at the next 25 days, 27 days as we get to the elections in terms of uh, whether this coronavirus is going to have an impact on all the science, you know, all the debates about the election and where things go. Well, I, along with a lot of people, were wrong in 2016 about what was going to happen. Um, I just, I just hope everybody goes out and votes, and I just hope that um, the election, whoever wins, wins by such a large margin that one side can't claim there's an issue with mail-in ballots, I'll be mailing mine in. Um, and it's unfortunate there, there, people are saying that because there are five states that have been doing all mail-in voting for years without issues. The military does it, the president does it. Um, so I'm not saying there won't be any mistakes, but there isn't every election. But I think the danger of catching COVID by waiting in long lines to vote in person, I think people should respect the, the mail vote more often and 
uh, than they do. And, and I just hope that it's not a close election because then we're going to, 2020 is going to keep on going, unfortunately. So get out there and vote. I, I, I agree. And I hope uh, Sean's classmates and friends and his cohort will go out and vote. One of the things that we learned is that when the voting age dropped from 21 to 18, back in the early 70s, the percentage of folks who uh, the, the the young vote actually reduced because they just didn't turn out in the numbers that they could have and should have. So we are always hopeful that younger people will, will vote. So my message to Sean and his friends is if they're 18, they should be voting uh, and participating. So uh, I guess this is where I say, young people like me, let's vote. Let's do this. <laughs> I think this year you're going to see the largest turnout of people who have not voted before. I really do. Yeah, let us not forget in 2016, 100 million people who could have voted didn't. Correct. And, that, and the margin the, in some precincts in certain states, as Michelle Obama told us at the DNC, was two votes. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I'm an opinion journalist now, so I can say that. But Sean's message was only to vote, not who to vote for. So that's a that, that's he's doing the right thing. Uh, the the professor has a has his own opinions, and so even on his Twitter page, it says vote Trump out because of the science. Well, there's a lot of reasons. That's just one of many. <laughs> I, I uh, think that the president of the United States should be capable, and if not, then shouldn't be there. And he's clearly not capable. And because climate change is is the most important issue for me, there almost couldn't be a worse candidate to vote for than the president. Well, on that note, we're going to let remind everyone that we are here live every single day, mostly at 9 p.m. Eastern. And as we ramp up to the elections, we're going to have more uh, uh, elect, uh, election-oriented topics. But turns out climate change is an election-oriented topic because we have to vote if we're going to make a change and see and save our planet, save our country. It's so important. I want to thank Professor Scott Mendia. Everyone, please follow him at AGW underscore prof and follow Sean on Instagram. He's Doug underscore Gribbs on Instagram <laughs> and check him out over there and give him some feedback. I know he'd be happy to hear from you and a big thanks to his uh, classmates. You want to give a shout out to your team? Yes, I'd like to thank Nick Grasso and Elisha Asif. Uh, did an amazing job. Nick was the one responsible for booking Mr. Mendia. And I think today just, well, this evening went absolutely splendid. Yes. Thank you very much to both of you. And uh, congrats, uh, Sean, on your work and your team's work. And Professor Mendia, if we can help you with your work in any way, please do reach out to us at Stony Brook Journalism. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. That was a great show produced by our students, and we're going to have several more episodes in the next few weeks as they get ready for their own innovation course. In their innovation course, they're working on uh, on ways in which they can show prototypes of innovation, and so that's why we're having them produce uh, episodes of this show, and I'm learning a lot from their choice of topics as well as their choice of of uh, guests. So it was great to have Professor Mandia here with us tonight. If you would like to participate in some way, check out my email address, email me. We're always looking for partners, sponsors, and other folks uh, in order to, uh, collaborators in order to get the word out about what we do. Uh, please tag your friends right now. They can watch this later. It was such a great conversation and so great to see the next generation is in such good hands with our students. And with that, I'll say, Good night, and thank you for watching. And you can find our entire archive on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash and we will see you soon. Thanks very much, everybody. Please stay in touch. Bye-bye.